So, I'm Russ Farmer. I'm a colorectal surgeon by training and trade, but I'm also a board certified general surgeon, so that means I'm here to talk to you guys about the acute abdomen. I have a really, really long slide deck that I'm not going to go through all of because you guys just ate lunch or are in the process of eating lunch and will most definitely fall asleep, especially it's Taco Bowl day, and so I always fall asleep on Taco Bowl day. So, um, I'm going to put that down for a minute. So when you think about the acute abdomen, right, there's a lot of different questions to answer. And when you look at your textbook, the differential diagnosis is long and involved, and it could be anything under the sun from appendicitis to diverticulitis to all the sort of things that you traditionally think of. But the way you think of it is going to be the thing that makes life a whole lot easier for you, okay? <laughs> so I'll teach you a little bit the way that I think of this problem and the way that when you're first assessing a patient, you can, if you can think about it this way, it'll make things a whole lot easier for you. Um, so we'll get into the slides and we'll blow through those at the end just for kind of completeness sake. But when you see a patient either in consultation in your office or in the emergency department, the way that I think of these patients in terms of physical exam, history, and everything like that is GI review systems, number one, Okay, review system gets brought up and made part of the HBI. So I go through a full GI review systems, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, obstipation, which is not the same as constipation. You know what obstipation is? Passing gas. Right, so complete obstruction, right? No, no passing gas, no passing stool. So constipation, remember, is when you are able to have a bowel movement, but you're like having a hard time getting the bowel movement out, right? It disappears. Obstipation is, I have a proof for it, right? So, bleeding, if any of you have between melanin and metaphysics, you guys all know this. So, full GI review systems, and then you do your physical exam, and it may or may not be informative. And we'll go through all these. There's like, I have something like 40 plus. There's like the Homan sign, the SOAS sign, and the Murphy sign. Everybody's got a, you know, I'm the only one that has a sign. Now. I'll get one. So, all those things are. Basically, all different ways of diagnosing things back before we had a lot of modern medical things. Um, so, the way to think of someone that has abdominal pain, or especially an acute abdomen, is to think of their body like you would think of the cross sectional plates in your anatomy textbook, or like you would on a CT scan, right? So, you think about where their pain is in their abdomen, and you draw a line from front to back. And then you list all the stuff that's in that line, and that's your differential diagnosis, and that's how you work up the patient, right? If it's right under water pain, you start from the skin. Could they have a skin abscess? Could they have hepatitis? Could they have cholecystitis? Could they have a biliary problem? Could the duodenum lives in the right upper corner? And you basically just draw a line from front to back, and everything that line touches from wherever their pain is until it comes out their back, that's in your differential. And then there's also like all the weird omas and stuff like that um, that kind of come up in the, in the process. Um, the number one red herring for uh, uh, general surgery res uh, med uh, residents that you guys as medicine doctors know way more about than we do would be, I go down there, I assess someone, they're horribly sick, they've got, you know, they look terrible, they're off on pressors and look like, look like snot, needy, hypotensive, tachycardic. Like, and there's no surgery I can do to fix this extremely common problem. Bueller, what? Well, okay, so sepsis, right? So sepsis is a symptom, not a diagnosis, right? So diagnosis. Pancreatitis. Hmm? Pancreatitis. All right, that's a good one. That's good. Not what I'm looking for, but excellent answer. Other thing is DKA, right? You can't operate and fix the DKA. People with patients with DKA have frequently horrible abdominal pain. I don't think anybody knows exactly why that is. My postulate would be that the endocrine pancreas is stressed to the max, and that's where their abdominal pain comes from. But so that's the thing that surgeons always keep under their toolkit, and they're like, oh, well, he's, he's got, I don't know what's wrong with him. It's DK. So let's go a little through a little bit of, of these slides. I'll just kind of forgive me if some of this is seemingly simple, but it, it bears repetition because all these things are potentially potential problems. So case number one, 24-year-old, healthy, young man, one day history of abdominal pain. Generalized at first, now it moves the right lower quadrant and radiates to his groin. Vomited twice. And then he has no appetite, okay? What is this? Simple, right? What is it? So every, it's every... So appendicitis, right? Okay, so the reason that we're going through these things is 
I'm going to give you kind of the pearls and the keys to diagnosing this versus other things, okay? Patients with appendicitis, the number one thing, if you like leave out everything else, they don't have an appetite. Like they talk about losing their appetite earlier in the day. So if they had like acute loss of appetite and they don't want to eat, but they felt fine before that, it's almost always appendicitis. Don't ask me why, that's just the way it goes. Um, so, next question. Does this gentleman need a CT scan? No. What's the sensitivity of CT scan for acute appendicitis? Anyway. 98%. So if you get a CT scan and there's no appendicitis on a CT scan, you can virtually set the positive that it's not there. But the flip side of that is you don't really need one in a young man. It's useful in young women, right? Um, what else do you want to know? Let's, let's skip this. So this stuff that they teach you in you know, medical school about location quality, severity, onset, duration, it almost, almost always gets left out of HPI. And it's super important in patients with acute abdomen because you have to know when did it start, what did it feel like, did you feel a tearing pain, is it a double pain, is it sharp, is it achy? Like all these different modifying factors are associated with different diagnoses. So for someone who's, died, who's had a tearing pain in their abdomen, that's likely a what? The past description, I've got tearing pain in my abdomen, it started about 30 minutes ago, and I feel horrible. Patients died for headache, sweating, hypercardia. What's that? The dissection. Dissection, okay. And what about sharp pain in the epigastrum? Positive rebound? Yeah, no, right. Okay. So the thing you need to know is that all these sources of pain are different based on the, the peritoneal surfaces that they're involved in. So you guys remember from anatomy, there's visceral peritoneum and parietal peritoneum. So the visceral peritoneum is the stuff that wraps all the abdominal viscera, right? These patients have really poorly localized pain in the epigastric region. Obviously, it's all the stuff that lives here that we kind of talk about. But the important part is that for patients that have pain that's involved with the visceral peritoneum, it's poorly localized, OK? Patients can have visceral pain, and they can just describe panabdominal pain, OK? So a patient that has um, you know, perforated diverticulitis that was confined to their left lower quadrant, and then something changed, and now they've got full-on abdominal pains because their pain is, the, the phlegmon and the inflammation is spread to their entire abdominal viscera, and now they have panvisceral peritoneal inflammation. The parietal peritoneum, obviously, is the lining, and so when you have inflammation in the parietal peritoneum, it's much more focal. So, for example, a patient that has localized inflammation from uh, parietal peritonitis will describe, you know, say, point with one finger where your abdominal pain is, and they point to their left lower quadrant, um, you know, and they're able to put like a specific one or two fingers on where their pain is, and you can examine them. It's there, but not in a place. It's because they're having parietal peritoneal inflammation. And then referred pain, everyone's favorite. So this, these are almost always based on embryologic uh, relatives. So the classic finding is a patient who has cystitis and has pain in the shoulder, right? And it's heard pain up the front of the nerve and into the shoulder. So that's subdiaphragmatic irritation. Patients with ureteral obstruction can have referred pain in the testicle. Along, uh, the genital nerves, gynecologic pathology uh, in the low back. The same thing is true of pancreatic pathology or, or lower abdominal vascular pathology. And then biliary disease with infrascapular pain. And then obviously the non-classical MI, right? So. Um, patients can kind of have vague pain in their genital or chest or upper abdomen or really anywhere, um, but that's referred pain as well. So relevant review of systems, right? So GI review of systems we talk about, AGU symptoms, okay? Like I sent a guy who, uh, let's see, I saw him in the office on Monday, and he said, I have horrible level or part of pain where my diverticulitis is going to come back. I'm going to have to have another colostomy. I said, how long did it last? He said, oh, it was about two or three hours. I went right away. I said, uh-huh. He said, I said, any other symptoms that went with it? He said, he said, no, not really. I said, do you have any blood in your urine? And he was like, oh, yeah, sure enough, I did. Got cast a kidney stone. Got sent to the colorectal surgeon for a kidney stone. So, <laughs> um, you know, a thoughtful GE review of systems is helpful. Um, vaginal discharge, vaginal bleeding always go along. So, um, you know, it's also uh, useful to take an obstetrical history, sexual activity history. Um, not every acute abdominal problem is a ruptured hollow viscous, ectopic pregnancy molar pregnancy, and then also fever, lightheadedness, kind of overall evaluation of the patient uh, systemically. And then obviously, previous surgery, gallbladder disease, liver disease, um, past surgeries on 
uh, GU system, tobacco, all the, this, this stuff is pretty straightforward and it's a very busy slide, but um, you guys know how to take a history at this point, you've done enough times. So the fifth world exam, power, diaphoresis, general appearance. So you guys know at this point what it is when I say the patient's sick or not, right? Like that's the cover. Say this guy's sick, this guy's not sick. So in general, when we look at someone with acute abdomen, you're trying to figure out are they septic and dying from a perforated hollow viscous, or is this something else, right? So once you put it in the something else category, then we can go down the pathway of trying to work it out, figure it out, ordering labs, getting scans, that sort of thing. If they are acutely ill, then we're obviously in the critical care pathway and then kind of go down that route. But orthostatic vital signs are real helpful, especially if you're trying to differentiate which pathway to go down, sick versus not sick. Um, patients that have arrhythmias, uh, number one uh, post-operative or number one um, arrhythmia associated with perforated hollow viscous or other you know, abdominal disaster, AFib. Patient comes in with new onset AFib, your red flag should go way up because that's, that's a, your canary in the coal mine that you're having some sort of problem with that's going on in the abdomen. So if I see a patient who had surgery three weeks ago and now has come back to the ER and they have new onset atrial fibrillation, it's, the problem is in their belly 100% of the time. Well, 99%. Um, look for distension, scars, masses. So hyperactive bowel sounds. I, I don't know if, I, so this is what we teach, right? This is what we teach interns on the general surgery service. And then we promptly throw their stuff that's away. So I don't understand. <laughs> hyperactive bowel sounds is useful for obstruction and useful for things, but there are patients that also just have hyperactive bowel sounds because they haven't eaten in a while. So it's useful, but it's not that useful. The much more useful thing is what, if someone's obstructed or not, is when you palpate their abdomen and you can do a succussion splash. You guys know what a succussion splash is? Anybody? Feel it? You can feel it. Tell me, she's nodding her head, yes, what's a succussion splash? I know, right? You nodded, and so I'm going to pick it. Is it like when you're feeling for like the, the wave? Right, so there's a fluid wave, there's a succussion splash. So fluid wave is the ascites, and the succussion splash is exactly what you described, and the cinnamon valley can actually push like the slosh, you listen to their belly, you can hear the slosh of the fluid back and forth in their, in their intestines, okay? Describe poorly, but um, come examine a, a, an obstructed patient, and it's pretty, it's pretty telltale when you see it. Um, masses, tenderness, if they have a palpable aortic aneurysm, right? So there'll be patients that can come in, um, and you put your hand on their abdomen, and they have obvious uh, pulse top mass. It's happened maybe three or four times, and those patients were sick and head ruptured. Organomegaly. Have you guys actually been able to feel someone that has true hepatosplenomegaly before? If you haven't, find someone that has and then really, really feel it because if they've got true splenomegaly, it's, it's scary, especially if you're going to have to take it out. About two weeks ago, I took out a guy's spleen that was like maybe 30 by 20 centimeters. It was gnarly horrible. Um, so, this is the thing that my interns always miss, and that every ER provider in the whole world misses, and I wish no one would. Look for hernias. If a patient comes in, they're complaining of vague abdominal pain, they're obstructed and distended, they can have a femoral or anal hernia, and everyone misses it. And you go down as the attending surgeon, you pull up the sheet, and you, and you look at them, and you just like look down, like, like this far. Like that's all you've done, and they have, this, they have a hernia there. But an exam is important too. And then my favorite, colorectal, right? A rectal exam. What's the only excuse for not doing a rectal exam? There's two. You don't have a finger? No finger, no rectal, right? So patients have an APR or you don't have any fingers. So, and then go act test. CBA tenderness, of course, for patients you're worried about, uh, urologic pathology, and then a pelvic exam. I've done plenty of pelvic exams for patients that have uh, vague pelvic pain. I couldn't find a problem with them. And so they ended up having an STD or some other um, pelvic pathology. So let's talk about the classical findings on exam. So guarding can come in two more versions, voluntary or involuntary guarding, okay? Voluntary guarding is, you'll know it when you see it because almost you feel like the patient's lying to you or something. Like you go to examine them and they kind of bunch up, but they don't bunch up when you touch them, they bunch up like right, right before you get there. Like does, does this make sense? So you go to put your hands in their abdomen, right? And they kind of cringe a little bit because you're about to, you know, touch them wherever they have to have reticulitis or whatever the thing is. Involuntary guarding is where you're talking to them. Like, this is the distraction technique, okay? Hey, how are you doing? You know, how's, uh, where are you from? You know, oh, you like horses, okay? And you put your hand there and they freak out, right? 
okay? That is much more involuntary learning, okay? So this one is much more <laughs> concerning than this one, okay? Rebound. So rebound is much more, much less specific, okay? But I found that it can be also similarly as concerning as patient with involuntary guard, okay? Um, so rebound is where you put your hands in the abdomen, right? And you say, it hurt more when I push in or when I let go, and when you let go, they freak out, okay? That's rebound, okay? Um, patient pain referred to the point of maximum tenderness when palpating adjacent quadrant, raw stain sign for appendicitis, right? You feel a contralateral side, and that results in peritoneal um, movement on the side of pathology, and it hurts, you know, on, on the right lower part, and the left. And then a rectal exam, um, it really, if you do a rectal and someone's not tender, then you need to send that patient to psych, right? Like, that's, <laughs> like that, that's a problem. So tenderness, everybody is tender on, tender on a rectal exam. The thing you're looking for on a rectal exam is a mass or blood, right? And even, you know, a dark stool, if I could be on iron pills, there's a million reasons a patient could have dark stool, okay? Who's ever seen a patient with melanin before? Real melanin, okay. What is, what is different about melanin as opposed to dark stool? Right, right, right. So, if nothing else, melanin stinks. If you remember nothing else, okay? Melanin smells. You can smell true melanin from down the hall, okay? So, if you get on a ward and you're like, what is that smell? That patient has melanin. There's a patient on the ward somewhere on the ward. Or a secret one. Um, differential diagnosis, it's huge, right? So, the history of physical exam. So, so, someone who is my favorite all-time internal medicine professor, um, Alberto Cui, I don't know if he's going to see this on YouTube, I'm going to link it to you, um, told me a long time ago that physical exam is used to confirm the diagnosis that you make by taking history. Okay? Um, there was a patient who came into the emergency department uh, with free air. He was sent over from Jewish South uh, when I was a chief resident. And I looked at him, I said, he's got a perforated ulcer. And he said, you didn't examine him. I said, yeah, I know, but he's got abdominal pain for here, year, and his lips were pain from where he'd been drinking pepto right? It was a pretty straightforward diagnosis. So that's what the physical exam is used to confirm what you know from history, and then obviously life-threatening pathology, as we kind of already talked about. So here's your list, right? Guys, memorize this real quick. <laughs> Just memorize this real quick, and then we'll go on. So the, the differential diagnosis for acute abdominal pain is huge. We'll just go through some of the highlights real fast. So when you see a patient in the ED or in your office for evaluation, not specific abdominal pain, this is from the emergency department literature, not surgical, so if the surgeon watches this, forgive me. But, um, their, their literature says non specific abdominal pain happens about 34% of the time. Um, appendicitis is the next most common, biliary tract disease, so, and that's the whole biliary tract, so that's common duct, cystic duct, gallbladder disease, inflammation, um, anywhere along the liver as well. Small bowel obstruction, most common cause of small bowel obstruction in America is? I'm, I'm dead. I'm actually legally dead, technically. Right, adhesions from what? Adhesions, are What's that? Prior surgery. What prior surgery? Hysterectomy. Thank you very much. That's good. All right. Um, pancreatitis is wonderful. You guys all know Ranson's criteria. That's actually really useful. Um, renal colic and then perforate ulcer. This still happens, right? Like it used to be much more common and everyone thinks the PPI has gotten rid of this problem. We still do a bunch of perforate ulcer disease. Um, and the cancer is actually much lower down in this as opposed to every other differential you had. And then diverticular disease. And then there's this kind of category of other. Uh, lost my thing here. So what kind of test should you order? It really depends on what you're looking for. So the best place to start if you're looking for, if you look at someone and you think, man, this guy's got a perforation, then just get an upright chest x-ray or an acute abdominal series for obstruction, right? So that will inform you more than anything. Start there, it's cheap, it's easy, and everyone can understand what it is, right? Ultrasound is good for vascular pathology and for biliary pathology, but not really much else in the upper abdomen. The lower abdomen is good for pelvic pathology. Um, patients that have like torsion ovarian, ruptured ovarian cyst, ovarian follicle, ectopic pregnancy, um, that kind of thing, it's really good for that. Um, CT, so the joke that we have with uh, the emergency room physicians. This is their joke, not mine. Is uh, I got a phone call one night and said, uh, "Hey, Farmer, I just got the guy out of the physical exam machine. The physical exam machine told me that he's got diverticulitis, right? <laughs> so don't be that guy. 
But, I mean, it's the workhorse of medical diagnosis anymore. I mean, scans are now quick and they're much cheaper than they've ever been. So the thing about is whether you want a contrast study or a non-contrast study. So if you're worried about vascular pathology, it's important to get a CTA versus you know, non-contrasted study. When in doubt, give oral contrast, okay? And when in doubt, give IV contrast unless you, you have a reason not to. Renal disease, diabetes, you guys all know these things, but um, it's always better, at least from my standpoint, to have IV and oral contrast if I can get it. Trauma situation, we can't give oral contrast because it takes a while to go in, but. Um, see what that is. MRI, very rarely if ever useful. The only time I can think I've ever worded MRI um, out of the ER was a patient who had recurrent, recurrent Crohn's and wanted to get an MRI. Interography. So uh, everybody wants to know what patient's white count is. So that's arguably the most important thing of this whole deal, right? If a patient has a normal white count, then my hackles are much less lower than if a patient's got a white count of 30. And we've, you know, now I'm like, okay, cool, what thing am I getting ready to take out? I'm excited. Um, chemistry. So patients that have valve obstruction traditionally have what chemical biochemical abnormality? So patients have valve obstruction and been vomiting up a bunch of hydrochloric acid traditionally have what? From a, there's a three word thing, right? Yes, say it louder. With, with, you're right, so. So hypochloremic, hypokalemic metabolic acid, correct? So remember you're throwing up all your chloride, right? And then um, LFTs, elevated amylase and lipase for pancreatitis, so elevated bilirubinemia, hyperbilirubinemia for patients with biliary pathology. So the most, one of the most common biliary pathologies in America, acute cholecystitis. Thumbs up or thumbs down for elevated bilirubin? Thumbs down, right, okay. So patients with acute cholecystitis very rarely have elevated bilirubin, right? With the exception of maybe one, and that's the acutely ill ICU patient who has acute onset abdominal pain or acute abdomen, and they have a calculus cholecystitis, right? And those patients can have mildly elevated bilirubin. Um, let's see, urinalysis, obviously, for patients that have uh, urinary tract pathology, UTI. GC chlamydia swabs is this thing that a lot of people leave out. Don't leave out STDs in your differential. So, and then, obviously, the gold fashion lactate. The thing that everyone leaves off of here, and I left it off because I forgot about it too, but you should never forget about it, is an ABG. If you're worried about a patient, like if you're really, really worried about a patient, and you look at them and say, I don't know what to do with them for the next 30 minutes, order an ABG. It takes about 15 minutes, and you've got another like 15 minutes after that to figure out what your problem is. And it looks smart when your attending comes by and you say, I got an ABG just because I was worried that I want to know what their base depth it was, and I just wanted to kind of get ahead of the eight ball. Now it looks real smart, and plus then you've got some extra information and buys you a little bit of time. When a patient comes in and they're acutely sick in the trauma bay and they've been bleeding to death, the first thing I do is get an ABG on them. Okay, so back to the patient with right lower quadrant pain. Uh, we don't need this, you guys know what appendicitis is. So, classic presentation of appendicitis, perimbilical pain, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, that, those things a little bit less so. Pain starts generalized to the whole abdomen, maybe epigastric moves to right lower quadrant. Um, that whole process only occurs in about a half to two thirds of patients. So one quarter of appendices are retrocecal, and so because of that, the patients will actually have plank pain. So you have to know that, keep that in your differential. The patient shows up with you with plank pain. They may actually have a retrocecal appendix. Um, a pelvic appendix um, can also result in superbuic pain, dysuria. There's also something called sterile pyuria. Do you guys know what sterile pyuria is? Anybody? Sterile pyuria? So sterile pyuria is a finding of leukocytes um, in the urine despite negative cultures and no bacteria. That's because you're sympathetically leaking leukocytes into your urine from some sort of pelvic acceptance process. The most common of those would be a pelvic appendix. Anybody in the audience know what an anion's hernia is? Anion's hernia? Okay. So that's something that none of my residents know either. It's my, my favorite pimp question of all time. So an anion's hernia is where you actually have the tip of the appendix that slid down through an inguinal hernia and got incarcerated in inguinal hernia. And so you got to do an open inguinal hernia or on someone for incarcerated hernia and you find their appendix and there's rupture. I've done two of those and they're both horrible. <laughs> um, so the findings on appendicitis will depend uh, on the duration of the symptoms. Obviously, we're going to talk about so. So a sign and obturator sign, we'll, we'll kind of go through signs here a little bit later, and then 
If they've got fever and, the, and they've got appendicitis, you're behind the eight ball because their rhinitis is probably ruptured. Okay. Another thing is patients with appendicitis usually don't have a wide count of 18 or 20. They got a wide count of 12 or 15. So if someone's got a wide count of 18 and they're complaining of right lower corner plane, you've got probably you're either the cat's out of the bag and they've got a ruptured appendix, or you're dealing with something else. You're dealing with teflitis, sequel volvulus, some sequel vascules, some other thing that's not normal appendicitis. So again, this is your analysis is abnormal. That's the sterile pie area, and then CBC is either not sensitive or not specific, obviously. Um, so the psoas sign, okay? So basically, you have them lay on their side, and you have them move their leg, and when you do that, the inflamed appendix will basically irritate, be irritated by that movement, and will result in pain. The obturator sign, right? So you passively flex the right hip and knee. And then internally rotate the hip. Because you have to do this when you give electrolytes so that you look dumb, right? Um, and so that will also result in abdominal pain. So CT findings, there's abscess or you know, inflamed appendix and phlegmon around uh, in the right lower quadrant. Um, and usually there won't be any contrast in the appendix because there has been luminal occlusion due to inflammation, right? So what do you do? What do you do in America? That's a better question. What do you do in America? We take the appendix out, right? Why? Why, why, do we, why do we take your appendix out? Because America, we can build one. I'm, I'm joking, okay. And what would they do in Europe? Nothing, right? So they didn't put them on antibiotics. Um, so, if you know, I'm going to talk about this. All right, case number two. 68-year-old lady with two days of left lower quadrant abdominal pain, diarrhea, fevers, chills, nausea. She vomited once at home. She's relatively healthy. She has a history of diverticulosis. Uh, she's on hydrochlorothiazide. So she's borderline tachycardic, chemodynamically normal. She's not febrile. And then when you examine her abdomen, she's got a mildly tender palpation left lower quadrant. So she's got guaiac negative neuron stool. Does anybody do guaiac anymore? Do we even do that? No. Because I mean, like, I don't know, at the VA, like, you have to, like, they don't even have the little drops. Like, you have to, like, put it on a card and send it to the lab. Yeah. Is that what you do now? Yeah, we have them here. We just don't. When I, was, when I was a medical student and intern, you had to like carry that stuff with you. If you didn't have it, you got in a lot of trouble. Um, so, differential diagnosis. Diverticulitis. Almost always diverticulitis. Both, but the red herring is diverticulitis, and it'll turn it on to be a ruptured uh, regular or single. Um, so, what is a diverticulum? Anybody know? So it's an apoptosis in the colon, right? Mm -hmm. Why? So, so sort of, right? So there's, so, what's that? Right. So the vasorect, the or the, the vasorecti, okay, of the colon run along the tenia of the colon, the shorter linear muscular parts of the walls of the colon, and where the vasorecti of the colon perforate through the wall and supply the colon on an anti-mesenteric border, usually. Um, then you can get weaknesses there for the areas of perforation. And as patients have a horrible Western non fibrous diet, there will be uh, increasing pressure and ultimately diverticuli in there. They usually have a change in bowel habits. They may or may not have urinary symptoms. They may or may not have tenesmus, depending on where it is. What's tenesmus? <coughs> it might? Yeah. Uh, right, exactly. They have the feeling like they have to go to the bowel, they have a bowel or go to the bathroom, but they can't. Right? Feeling of fullness. And then they may have an ileus, um, and then they may or may not have a sympathetic small bowel obstruction, depending on how, how bad the inflammation is. They usually have a low grade, and they have a high grade fever. Um, localized tenderness with rebound and guarding, and left sided pain on rectal uh, on exam. So if you put your finger in their rectum and then push to the left, they can, well, that pain is worse than the pain on the right. Although I'm not sure how you can loosen that, because if you're getting that involved when you're doing a rectal exam, then um, you're either in my line of work or really weird. Um, then, uh, they may or may not have occult blood. Okay, bleeding diverticulosis is, is, is common. And then they may or may not have peritoneal signs. So remember that rebound, guarding, all these other sort of things are peritoneal signs. But if you've ever truly examined someone with a ruptured viscous, you know an exam from that versus someone who doesn't have a ruptured viscous. If you've, and people in, in the room that have done it will back me up. But... When you put your hand on the abdomen of someone that has perforated diverticulitis or perforated appendicitis or perforated ulcer, 
they are not your friend anymore. <laughs> okay, you might be show up and be the nicest guy in the world and be there to help them out. Like they don't want to talk to you anymore, and they're usually double over like this. And then the most important question on patients, I think, is how was the ride over? How'd you get here? Because if they like, were like, man, going over a bridge and like going over steep, speed bumps was horrible and I wanted to die, they've got a perforation somewhere. Okay. Um, how do you diagnose diverticulitis? CT scan is the workhorse for diverticulitis. So paraclonic surface straining, around diverticulae, thickened bowel wall, periverticular abscess. These are all kind of go hand in hand. And then leukocytosis is rarely present. Okay. So now, because this is diverticulitis was my disease. And then about 10 years ago, it became your disease. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So what's the deal with diverticulitis now? Someone who knows anything about this. Okay. Why is it now your disease? You don't operate. You're using the biotics for this. Right. So there's four grades of diverticulitis. There's Henchy grade 1, 2, 3, and 4 diverticulitis. Okay? Henchy 4 is frank fecal peritonitis. Henchy 3 is purulent peritonitis. Henchy 2 is localized purulent disease and Hinchy one is like a just like micro perforation micro right? So long and short of this is the vast majority of people in the United States that have diverticulitis are going to show up to your office as an outpatient thing. Okay? They don't come to the hospital with this anymore. It's only because we've really started to recognize it. So if you, they show up to your office as an internal medicine provider or a personal physician for these patients and they say kind of baby left over fire pain kind of changes in bowel habits, not feeling real well, low grade fever. Almost all the patients that have diverticulitis are just sent home with oral antibiotics anymore. And then if they progress and they come to the hospital, um, unless the patient has frank purulent or fecal peritonitis, the chances of them getting an operation acutely is very low. So of all the patients that you diagnose with diverticulitis, the chance of needing an operation ultimately is less than 20%. I mean, it's much less than 20%. It's probably like 5 or 10% anymore these days. So how many episodes of diverticulitis do you have to have to get an operation? Benign diverticulitis. Mm -hmm. In Europe, it is something like 15. So unless they have life-limiting problems from their diverticulitis or comorbid medical problems, their diverticulitis is so bad it's obstructing their ureter and they've got hydronephrosis, they've got you know, you know, issues like that, or it's completely obstructing their colon and they're unable to poop, then we don't operate on diverticulitis. Um, fluids, electrolytes, antibiotics, right? So whatever your gram-negative coverage of choice is, everybody picks something different because we've never studied this and no one knows what's better or not. Although I will say flagell, flagell, and then when you're in doubt, flagell. I give my wife flagell every day just because I think it's so homeopathic. Uh, <laughs> Colorectal right, so surgeons love flagell. I put it in the water. I think. And then uh, for outpatients, obviously non-toxic patients, some people may or may not recommend a liquid diet for 48 hours. I, unless you feel like the patient's becoming progressively obstructed, I think that's um, not necessary. And then cipro-flagel. So I only get on my soapbox about like two or three things. Most of them are operative technical things, but one of them is for patients that have, unless they're very frankly obstructed at air flow levels on their CT scan, the option of a, like a liquid diet or a full liquid diet is totally worthless, okay? If you put something in someone's GI tract, it doesn't matter what it is, by the time it leaves the pylorus, it's a liquid, okay? So if you're giving a patient Jello, you can probably give them a hamburger, unless you're worried they're gonna aspirate a hamburger as opposed to aspirate Jello, and that'd be the only time. Otherwise, when it leaves the pylorus, it's the exact same thing. Okay, uh, case number three. 46 year old guy who has a history of alcohol abuse. Okay, for general surgery oral boards, I'd probably cut it right there. But um, with three days of severe upper abdominal pain, vomiting, subjective fevers. He's homeless, he's, uh, obviously heavy alcohol use, two pack per day smoker. We obviously don't know anything about him because he's homeless and probably a little bit more abundant. He's hypotensive, tachycardic, although he's still holding his airway. He's ill appearing in pain, he's riding around in the gurney. Um, normal heart sounds, he's mildly descended, he's got container palpation, epigastrin, voluntary guarding. What is it? Anyway? Pancreatitis, right? How many causes of pancreatitis are there? Right. Two, right? I don't have any Madagascar scorpions in my pocket. So. And in the record, there's only two causes of pancreatitis. Maybe three if you count um, Pepsid and, and, and medicine and stuff like that. But really, there's only two causes. 
alcoholic pancreatitis versus gallstones, right? So diagnosing someone with pancreatitis, you guys, I, don't, I won't belabor you with going through all the different Ransom's criteria, but um, there are drugs that are associated with amiodarone, antivirals, some diuretics, some NSAIDs, antibiotics, but NSAIDs are obviously much more results associated with peptic ulcer disease, gastric ulcer disease. Type 4 gastric ulcers specifically. Um, so patients with epigastric pain, they describe a constant boring pain and a pain that radiates to the back. How long do I have for this? Well, our lecture is still two, but I'm doing questions after this. Okay, so go until you throw me off the stage. Good. Um, knowledge of all the okay? And then physical findings. They often will have low-grade fever. They're almost always tachycardic. Because it's, sometimes it's due to fluid status, sometimes it's due to pain. They may or may not be hypotensive. Um, they can have a Cullen sign, which is a bluish discoloration around the umbilicus. So you look around their umbilicus and they have um, this kind of thing that looks like a bruise. And then the gray Turner sign, the bluish discoloration of the flanks from retro retroperitoneal hematoma and inflammation, right? If they've gotten to this point, this is the, this is the oh crap stage, right? Like this is this patient's gonna like kick it, right? So if they got hemorrhagic pancreatitis, uh, short of giving them FFP and going to the chapel, it's, it's going to be a long night. Um, so elevated lipase, elevated amylase, non-specific, although lipase is much more sensitive and specific than amylase, even though everyone kind of wants to hang their hat on amylase, which is, is interesting. Uh, always get a right apart ultrasound, even in a patient who has, you know, you would think be an alcoholic pancreatitis, it's always good to make sure that um, it's not due to gallstones. Remember, doc, doc can have ticks in, please, right? So, and the CT scan is useful only if um, you're worried about the nature of their pancreas, if they're worried about necrotizing or hemorrhagic pancreatitis. Otherwise, simply admitting them, watching the serial, you know, analyze the lipase levels and slowly feeding them. MPO, you can use antibiotics if patients are getting worse. And so people always talk about imipenem as, and you know, patients get um, acute pancreatitis and everyone wants to put them on carbapenems for some reason, although I think it, it probably doesn't help that much. Um, the thing that you don't do, don't ever do, don't ever, ever, ever do, even though I see doctors do this all the time, please, if someone has a pancreatic fluid collection on CT scan, do not put a needle in the pancreas. Do not sample that fluid. It will do you no good. It will not change your management, okay? If someone is sick enough that you're worried about them having a, a peripancreatic fluid collection that is infected, then want antibiotics, okay? Because I've seen probably 10 or 12 patients in the past seven or eight years that have had that done, had their CT, their, their fluid aspirated, and subsequently they developed necrotizing pancreatitis from that fluid being infected by the act of aspirating. All right? So don't do it. That's, I'll, I'll turn and take off Dr. Vitali's hat now. Let me go on something. All right. Yes, question. Um, so, is it possible to have pancreatic fluid collection and have a CT scan that So if a patient comes in and they're admitted and they have you know, alcoholic pancreatitis and they're just like doing well on the floor, the only time I would get um, like a CT on them is if you're worried about, um, one, if they start showing signs of you know, progressing you know, systemic response, systemic inflammatory response, or for some reason if you're worried about other concomitant pathology, like they have you know, elevated alkaline phosphatase, it's like way through the roof, you know, hyperbilirubinemia. anemia, and then the other thing is if they're not improving. So like if the, so you guys know the definition of insanity, right? Anybody know the definition of insanity? It's the same thing over and over and doing the same thing over That's right. So one of my favorite quotes of all time, doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. So if a patient is stagnant, then I would scan, right? Because that means there's, some, there's something that's not right, okay? Because the inflammation from alcoholic pancreatitis and biliary ductal problems, if you clear their bile duct, you know, using ARCP or whatever method, if you clear their bile duct and you allow time for their inflammation to die down from their alcoholic pancreatitis or chronic pancreatitis or whatever, they should get better. But if they're not getting better, then it's because they have some they have an anatomic obstruction from either a tumor or a cyst or something. Okay. 
So if they're not, you know, they're not getting better, or they're, you know, they're not getting better, they're getting worse than scam. <laughs> if they're getting better, then leave them alone. Yes. Sure. So, peripatic pseudocysts should not be beginning to develop until at least, at the absolute minimum five days. It's probably going to be at least a week to two weeks before you see a pseudocyst, right? A pseudocyst happen in patients that are getting better, right? So, pancreatic necrosis only happens in patients that are not improving. So, um, patients that are developed that will get a pseudocyst are those patients that have had their problem, they're getting better, and then when they follow up, you know, they get a scan for whatever reason, and then, you know, they've got this aberrant finding there. So the way it goes a lot of times, it seems like in patients that are improving, is that they're doing fine, and you're following them back up in the office, and then all of a sudden, they complain of symptoms of gastric outlet, right? So patients that have gastric outlet obstruction, or they're not able to eat, uh, or they vomit constantly after they eat, and they've got obstructing pseudocystis. There's going to be a, there's a, probably the vast majority of patients with pseudocysts, like if they get better from their initial insult of pancreatitis and they follow up, you're not going to get a scan on them. There's probably a whole subset of patients out there that have pseudocysts that we never even know about. And they just kind of float along and they resolve their, you know, small pseudocysts and then everybody just, you know, just kind of goes away on its own. Because the vast majority of pseudocysts, you just watch them. They go away. Yes? I think you mentioned earlier you uh, turned the light face or you follow the light face. Mm -hmm. What's that? What's that? What's the utility? Um, that's probably very right long. So, I mean, so the, the searchable way of thinking about pancreatitis, at least in my limited mind, is that um, if their MLAs is trending toward, when it becomes trending toward normal, that's when you can start thinking about treating this. Like, once it starts going down, then you, you're fine. If, it's keep, if it continues to elevate, once, once it peaks and it starts going back down, then you, you're, you're fine treating them and do whatever you want. But like the thing is, is if you admit them and they've got you know one of these horrible signs of you know whichever Scottish physician they're named for, um, you know then you want to trend out those those findings because if their amylase is progressively elevating, it kind of helps make you make your mind up. You're like, well, his amylase is stayed the same and it's really horrible, or it's going up, and his white count's still up, and his heart rate's still up, and now he's knocked over into a systemic inflammatory response and it was terrible now on our right? But versus like the guy that's kind of sick but his amylase is kind of leveled off and it's starting to go down now, maybe we can pull off and walk like so that's I kind of get it's kind of one of the it's one part of the whole clinical picture. Does that make sense? Yeah. So but yeah, no if their amylase and my face are leveled off and they're starting to go down, then I think that's that's useful. But I mean once they're once they're starting to go down after a day or two, then you know, gotta check my All right, next thing. Please stop me. I love, I love questions like that. That's good. So, um, 72 year old guy with coronary artery disease on aspirin and plavix. He had several days of dull upper abdominal pain, now with worsening pain in, in his entire abdomen. Okay. Some relief with food until today. Okay. So, if I covered up the some relief with food part, what would you guys think it was? Okay, worsening pain in the abdominal abdomen, patient on plavix and coronary artery disease. It's properly. It's Derek Senior, right? Okay, and then by adding the relief with food part, that's going to be what, right? Um, okay, so he's on all of the standard coronary artery disease meds. He's a smoker, of course, because everybody in Kentucky smokes. Um, borderline hypotensive, but um, meh. And then his abdomen, he's mildly distended and diffusely tender palpation with rebound and guarding. We talked about ulcers, we talked about mesenteric ischemia. So risk factors for peptic ulcer disease, H. pylori, you guys all know a lot of this stuff, NSAIDs, smoking, and then there's actually a hereditary component to uh, peptic ulcer disease as well. They talk about burning epigastric pain, and then they have like an empty or a hungry feeling, and food makes it better, and it will awaken them in the middle of the night. So the elderly will not necessarily have all these symptoms, but they can present with some or, or a few of them. So they typically will have epigastric tenderness, and they may have some fairly severe generalized pain, um, and then there may or may not be occult blood, and you put an NG tube down them, you may get blood, you may not. Um, they may have occult blood on a rectal exam, um, they may or may not be anemic. It's kind of one of those things that, we, again, the history tells you what it is, 
and then ultimately your physical exam and your lab make the diagnosis. So what do you do? Put them on PPI drip, right? Avoid NSAIDs, and then you watch them unless they have a perforation in which you take them and do a gram patch, which is one of the most fun things you can do. Um, you guys know that. All right, what's this? Who's an intern, right? No, no senior residents. Where are the interns? All right, what's wrong with this? Free air. Free air. Good. Okay, outstanding. So. so, the thing about peptic ulcer disease is the pain that you get with peptic ulcer disease is almost always it's like a light switch. Like, they can tell you when they perforate. I perforated yesterday at 2 p.m. Because the pain started, like, and that's exactly what it, the way it, you know, ends up looking when you look at their stuff in the OR. Um, obviously, for because they have a perforation, you put them on antibiotics, and then we take them to the OR and patch them up, they're fine. Um, a 35-year-old lady with uh, emergency department with nausea and vomiting uh, for a day or so with generalized abdominal pain. The last stool was two days ago. She had a hysterectomy for fibroids. Mildly tachycardic, normotensive, moderately distended, mildly tender, hypoactive bowel sounds, normal exam in terms of tenderness, right? Sorry, it's crummy, it's not projecting on. What's the, for tenderness is a really pretty picture. So these are, these are air fluid levels, okay? So this, this chick is obstructed, right? We talked about having hysterectomy and being obstructed. So, number one cause are, first of all, bowel obstruction is always a mechanical problem, right? It's an anatomic problem. It's very rarely if ever a physiologic problem, unless you're on Dr. Abel's service, in which case it's a physiologic problem because everybody else is given it. Um, so, adhesions from previous surgery, and then never forget growing hernia, and then any other number of things. Cancer um, can be uh, a frequent cause, re you know, recurrent cancer. Um, anything can cause an obstruction if it's anatomically related. Patients feel full, they feel bloated, they um, very rarely, but occasionally, occasionally patients will come in and you say, I'm going to put a tube down your, down your nose and decompress you, and they will look and you say, thank you, because they're tired of throwing up and tired of feeling bloated. Um, what's timpani? You guys still percuss when you examine people? Yeah, he's in there. So you put your abdomen, hand on the patient's abdomen and you thump the back of your finger and they sound hollow, right? And I know it's dorky, but I, th I think physical exam is still useful for things like that. So, um, so patients that have no, that have like semi-normal labs to normal labs, and have had intermittent bowel obstruction um, or non-hydrated bowel obstruction, then we watch them almost universally. Put an NG tube down, watch them to see if they get better. There's some patients who put an NG tube down because they have and they refuse because they've been in the system for so long. Um, Getting serial abdominal x-rays on someone that is distended and you're worried about an obstruction is worthless, okay? Until their symptoms improve, it's not, it's not worthwhile. You're going to spend money and you're still going to wait until their bowels open up because even if their abdominal x-rays show improvement, until they're actually passing gas in stool, what do you care? Right? Treat that as a patient, not the picture. Um, if they have a lack of gas in their distal bowel and in their rectum, it usually means they have a small bowel obstruction because neither the gas nor stool can get into their colon or rectum. And then CT scans are really useful, obviously, to identify the cause of the problem. Um, treatment, obviously, you guys know how to get fluids and put an NG tube down someone. Um, and then if they have a complete obstruction, the old mantra was you never let the sun rise or set on a bowel obstruction. That's what they, we used to teach in terms of surgery. That's not necessarily true anymore. There's a lot more leeway. But the worry was because, um, for whatever reason, we were worried back in the old days that um, we would never, you know, patients would progress or they'd have an ischemic bowel or whatever, the bowel would become necrotic or they would perforate, even though it's not necessarily the case. So we watch almost everybody for an initial period of observation with the bowel obstruction now, unless we can point to it exactly in the spot on CT scan or something like that and say, oh, there's one band right here, let's just go cut it. Um, okay, it's about 1.30. Cholecystitis, you guys know cholecystitis, it's pretty straightforward. Is this stuff appropriate for what you guys are wanting? Okay, all right. Um, 
You guys are closest dice. Let's, let's renal colic. Okay. This is the one that everyone forgets. Ovarian torsion. Okay. So don't forget this in your differential diagnosis when you're seeing a patient with abdominal pain, especially uh, young ladies. Um, yeah, they'll have, you know, relatively mild, mild leukocytosis, and they have horrible abdominal pain, a horrible abdominal exam. And you go down and examine the ED, and you think to myself, "My God, what's wrong with this?" You know, nice young lady, and you're worried that some, there's some bad thing. And really, all it is is you need to get a pelvic ultrasound and diagnose them with ovarian torsion. And we usually just take them to the OR and then detorch their ovary and, and assess whether or not it's viable. So keep that in the back of your mind when you're when you're going through testicular torsion. You can get referred pain from testicular torsion. So if you examine the patient's abdomen and you can't, you know, really find any pathology there, usually what the, the way this goes is. <laughs> You'll examine them. You can't really think of them. their history. Doesn't make any sense. They've got you know horrible testicular pain, and it radiates up. And either they don't, they, they are not articulate enough to describe their um, onset of their testicular pain, or something doesn't make sense. And so every once in a while, you'll get called with referred abdominal pain from testicular torsion. Um, so one thing to talk about is abdominal pain in the elderly, and they really have altered you know, nociceptive capabilities, right, along with everything else. And so patients that have acute onset of abdominal pain and are older than the age of 65 or 70 have a high rate of mortality because their pathology is usually more um, advanced or complicated and then they also don't have the mechanisms to fight it off. And so things to think about, again, the causes in the elderly are the same they are in young people, except you're, you have to think about diverticulitis a little bit more. But the other thing is we're actually seeing quite a rash of peptic ulcer disease and, and perforated uh, ulcers in um, nursing home patients. Uh, and so if you ever see a nursing home patient who comes in more abund and um, you're concerned about why they're there and you can't really figure it out, put that in the back of your mind just to uh, hopefully it'll scratch the back of your mind in the middle of the night when you're seeing those patients. Don't forget rupture triple A, mesenteric ischemia, MI, and then the aortic section. These are diseases of the older population um, as they're um, blood vessels kind of age, and then you'll, they're at risk for aneurysms. And so um, let's see, let's get through all this. You guys know most of this stuff. Um, we already talked about AAA a little bit. Okay, GI bleeds. Most of the time, GI bleeds don't cause pain, though. That's the interesting thing. So bleeding peptic ulcers can cause pain. Esophagitis can cause pain. Patients with Mallory Weiss tears will have chest pain usually, but they don't have acute onset abdominal pain so unless it's like, you know, really high, you know, infradiaphragmatic or kind of epigastric pain. Um, that's right. This is what I wanted to get to. So the, the clinical pearls for acute onset uh, abdominal pain. So patients that have Real bad abdominal tenderness, you shouldn't ever just write them off as gastroenteritis, okay? So the sine qua non of patients that have horrible mesenteric ischemia and is abdominal pain on a proportion exam, right? That's the thing that we always talk about in surgery. If you go examine someone and they have virtually no, <laughs> the surgeons are we're so stupid, it's always like check box, yes or no, right? Do they have an exam? Like, not, what's the quality of the exam? Do they have one? I Meaning, do they or not have, yes or no, do they have peritonitis, right? So these patients, quote, won't have an exam. Um, but what they will have is horrible visceral abdominal pain, okay? And so patients that have abdominal pain that's absolutely, you know, literally gut-wrenching, you can't blow them off, no matter what. Um, the incidence of gastroenteritis in the elderly is very, very low, despite what others would tell you. So if someone comes in with abdominal pain and they're elderly, um, exhaust all other options before you just chalk it up to diarrhea. Um, elderly patients are prone to things like, you know, sigmoid volvulus, um, all the vascular pathologies. Um, older patients with renal colic symptoms always make sure to exclude a triple A. Um, severe pain, uh, that's the same thing as before. Um, you can tell when I had some redundancy in making these. Um, you can also tell it's important because I said it multiple times. Um, acute cholecystitis is the most common surgical emergency in the elderly. Um, and then just because you don't have free air on a chest x-ray does not rule out perforation. Um, 
And then if biliary colic lasts more than six hours, you need to think about cholecystitis, because a lot of times patients will have symptoms of biliary colic and they'll pass the stone. So it's just like a kidney stone, and they'll ultimately, their biliary tree will decompress and they won't have um, biliary, you know, they won't be obstructed anymore, and their pain will get better, and their colic will go away. So that's enough PowerPoint, because I was a resident not too long ago, and I hate PowerPoint. So what do you guys want to know? I, you got a surgeon for 30 minutes, ask me anything, right? Just like right back. Can you uh, talk to us about toxic megacolids in our Yes. When do you, like, okay. what's the cutoff for radiographic or when do you start? So, um, the traditional cutoff for radiographic evidence for toxic megacolon is, some people say, 9 or 10 centimeters. Um, and, you know, to you can have a megacolon and not be toxic, and you can have toxic colitis and not have a megacolon, right? So the, the textbook definition of toxic megacolon is someone who has an extremely steady colon, a loose size of a fever, right? Plus minus type of right? So that's the traditional definition of toxic megacolon. So, but there are people out there that get fulminant colitis that have normal size colon. I got one of my servers right now. The guy upstairs, he's got horrible fulminant colon. Well, didn't have him until this morning. But horrible fulminant colitis. This horribly thickened colon on CT scan. You, know, fall, you, know, you can see it obviously in a plain film too, but it's full colon is normal size because it's decompressed because it's got a colostomy. So, yeah, operation for toxic, toxic colon is if someone fails management or they you know, persistent tachycardia, persistent leukocytosis, you know, and obviously if it's from him, him and the man from the robot, they Anything else? Yeah. Um, with filler and colic, is it actually a chronic thing? Because that's just one that usually can be constantly well. It's it's iron. So, um, remember what Dr. House says, right? Patients lie. <laughs> so some patients will say that the pain is colicky and comes and goes, and some patients will say the pain is constant. And the trick is, when do they come to you? Do you are you a physician that's working in an outpatient office and you see that patient, um, or you say? That patient calls us a doctor and have to farm pain. So they come into my office, they come in, see a few hours later, they've got pain, and they go home, or you send them to the ER. By the time they get to the ER, the stone's fast and it's better. Or do they have persistence to stone stuck and they need to have their, you know, they need to have the problem water out, or they, have, they pass the stone and the inflammation remains. Because there's some patients that the stone comes and obstructs their, their cystic gut, and ultimately they pass the stone, or the stone refluxes back into their normal life and cystic gut. But the bacterial insult and biliary contamination has already occurred. And so the they're making the difference between biliary colic and cholecystitis, right? So someone who has biliary colic likely does not have acute cholecystitis. Someone that has persistent abdominal pain likely has acute cholecystitis. Does that like, make sense? So biliary colic is probably a precursor symptom to ultimately developing acute cholecystitis. I think I did the very clock for the next one, so. <laughs>